morning, everyone, and uh, great to be here, Jeff. Uh, great to be with you. Good to see you, Richard. And I've, uh, I must say, I've been really looking forward to this. Uh, got me out of an office works board meeting, and uh, <laughs> uh, it also, uh, uh, you know, GE is a company that I've admired and West Farmers has admired for a long time, and in, in, in some ways tried to model ourselves on some aspects of GE, and, and you as a person is someone I admire. So I'm really looking forward to having a bit of chat and, and learning a bit, and, and hopefully the audience will... Last time we were together was Beijing, I think. Yeah, so it's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had a great uh, session. Jeff came and had a chat to the West Farmers board in Beijing a few months ago, and uh, uh, they took a lot of notes. Yeah. And they keep saying to me, hang on, GE well, we're does in this, this together, so... Why don't, why don't we do... Anyway. Yeah, good. So uh, let's start big and we'll get smaller, and if... Mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll have a bit of time for, for uh, questions from, from the group here, but uh, we might even touch on football towards yeah, the end, good. so that'd be good. good. Uh, so let's, I think your travels this time, you just told me you're on the road seven months a year. Your travels this time, I think you've been to Turkey, Algeria, Indonesia, Malaysia, Australia, yeah. home tomorrow. How's the world looking? So the, uh, uh, the first thing I'd say is, I, the one thing I told the team is I came this in October, I usually come in August when the footy show is available. So I miss that, Richard, <laughs> but uh, uh, that's the only downside about being in Australia here. So uh, I think the world's okay. You know, in, in many ways, I think the world is uh, similar to the way it's been over the past, uh, let's say, post-financial crisis uh, time period. And, and I would say U.S. is probably the best uh, uh, I've seen since the financial crisis. The growth is more broad-based. It's still in the, let's say, 2 to 2.5% two range, and, and maybe that's the new normal, but it's consistent and a little bit broader-based than it's been over the past couple of years. Uh, Europe and Japan are still quite tough. So you have 40% of the world's economy that is still you know, you know, difficult, not going uh, downward, but uh, uh, I would say stable but flat. And, and in many ways, that's kind of what we've faced over the past decade or more. So it's not like that's extraordinarily different. It's just disappointing because we'd like to see it uh, grow faster. And then the rest of the world, you know, it's, it's, it's mixed, but I'd say on balance, it's positive. Right. So China growing at 7% plus is still a positive force in the world. You mentioned I was in uh, the Middle East and North Africa probably two weeks ago. Uh, that region for us will grow 25% this year, something like that. So you're basically, you know, in Algeria, fly over a war, go to another country, fly over another war, you know, and people are still investing in electricity and things like that. So I, I'm still a believer that the uh, growth markets will, will perform, but with volatility. Right. So we, we prepare ourselves for a slow growth world with volatility, but one where you can invest and grow. And I think in that regard, 2014 is, uh, is not a lot different than 2013 or 2012. It's, it's just what we have to live with. And there's two types of volatility, aren't there? There's volatility in, in the markets that you, you operate in and we operate in, and then there's financial mm -hmm. markets volatility. Uh, I, I've just done an investor trip um, to the UK and US, and I came back and I, I felt... Um, I don't know, financial markets to me, I've never been one, but feel like sort of a heroin addict. Um, before the global financial crisis on heroin, you know, big returns, expecting returns every mm -hmm. year. Global financial crisis came on, the doctor put them on methadone or whatever it is. And now every time the doctor threatens to take them off methadone, which is cheap money, yeah. um, the patient's kicking and screaming. Uh, you know, do you sense there's a difference between financial markets and the real market? You know, in the end, they, they should yeah. be in the same place, I agree. right? But I don't think they're always in the same place every day. Yeah. And, and in some ways, one of the things we all wrestle with is people want the world to be different than it is. You know, in other words, people want to wake up and be back in 2005 or 1995. And so instead of slow growth and volatility, which is where we are, so I think, to a certain extent, expectations and reality get mismatched when really what you're seeing is consistency. And then, you know, we, we had earnings uh, last Friday. We always prepare well for that. And, you know, the market's just cratering the whole week last week. But we grew orders 22%. Our organic growth is going to be at the high end of the range, you know. We, we saw growth across uh, six of seven of our industrial businesses, et cetera, et cetera. So the presentation we're putting together is different than the headlines you're reading each and every day. 
And you know, you always worry a little bit about that because you don't want to be uh, Pollyanna-ish, but at the same time, it's important to just say, here's what we're seeing, and there's still opportunities mm. out there. And you know, that's I think the world we live in. I think you know, people want people want something different than what they're seeing. You know, Richard and. Yeah. I think it's what's always easiest for, uh, you know, for business leaders is just to deal with the world as you as you see it. You have to have an economic point of view, get people ready for that, and if suddenly everything is uh, markedly better, that's great. Mm. But but we're gonna we're gonna have to make our own growth yeah. in order to be successful. Yeah. So uh, I mean, I absolutely agree with you on the low growth on the on the on the volatility issue. Um, uh, when, again, when you spoke to the, to the West Farmers Board a few months ago, I think you said cyber security was number one for you. What are the things that you worry about that could impact your businesses and impact the markets in which you operate? So when I think about the enterprise risk for a company like GE, you know, there's plenty of risks to deal with, but, but the true kind of enterprise risks are things like uh, liquidity in a crisis. So we've kind of lived through that mm -hmm. in, in the financial crisis. Uh, cyber security, which is... Uh, you know, something that has to be owned at the top of the company, but this is emerging technology. This, this threat is emerging. We learn something new really every day. In our line of work, we worry a lot and manage a lot around product failure. You know, when you, uh, when you uh, fly home for wherever you're going and you look out the window and there's GE engines there, you want to know that I worry about that, and I, <laughs> and I, and I do, believe me. And then the fourth, uh, the fourth enterprise risk is compliance at the top of the house. You know, with, uh, with 307,000 people, while you and I are sitting here in this period of time, there's 20 of them out there cheating, you know? Yeah. In other words, it's, it's impossible to expect that everybody is in spec all the time, but we're going to find them and we're going to fire them, right? We're gonna, we've got a great ombuds process. We've got a great audit staff. We've got transparent culture. We're going to find them. But where companies fail is when it's happening in the boardroom or in the senior executive ranks. And so, you know, that's why for us, culture is really important. And so those are the four things I probably worry the most about in terms of, uh, you know, where the world is. And then the last point I'd make, Richard, David and I were talking about this earlier. I'm 32 years with GE. I grew up in a centralized, control-based world. Those days are over. Mm. You know, the notion that you could, you know, and, and what you fight when you're in a centralized, control-based world is, Every time you see something new, you, you want to add a new organization or a new review or a new process. But you know, I guarantee you, me reviewing the uh, LNG uh, uh, turbo machinery on the Gorgon project from Fairfield, Connecticut, ain't going to cut it, right? That, that, that should make nobody feel better about, about. But at the same time, putting great people at the point of attack who are empowered to make the right decisions backed by the best technology that's prepared to move at a moment's notice, that's risk management. And so I think we live in a, a risk-reward world. We don't live in a centralized, control-based world. And people in my generation have had a hard time, I think, adjusting from one side of that equation to the other. Because it's always easy to add another review, another organization, another checklist. But that's not really how you're going to be able to thrive and actually do good risk management in the world we live in today. Yeah, I agree. I'm going to go off, off piste a little bit because you said when, when you're going through the four things there, you talked about liquidity. Yeah. And you and I both faced into liquidity issues in, in 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just share with the audience your reflections on that? Because, you know, I think one of the things, I don't know, one of the things about being a CEO is everyone expects you to be a great CEO on day one, and it's a bit of a journey, isn't it? And well, you, look, and I think seeing tail risk, I, I think... Um, so I joined GE in 1982, and then I became CEO in 2001. And in that 20-year time period, I had never seen tail risk. You know, I, I had seen economic cycles and things like that, but I had never seen, you know, a one in a million event. Now I've been CEO more than 12 years. I've seen like five of them, mm -hmm. right? And, and so you become a different leader when those things uh, take place. And, and I think what happened in 2000, you know, the, the financial market seizing, AAA rated companies uh, facing into markets that had seized, right? You never thought yeah. that would take place. And the only anecdote to that is to have close to $100 billion of cash on your balance sheet, which we do, <laughs> which we do, you know? So that's your, that's, you know, it's not like you have a fancy answer yeah. on those things. But I, I think, I think you, you become a better CEO, not by being perfect, but by, by 
being willing to face into your own mistakes and get better and, and learn from them and, and prepare the whole organization as you go through that. I talk to a lot of CEOs around the world and I, I think in particular Brazil, Brazilian CEOs are quite good. And one of the reasons why is in the 1990s, they lived through hyperinflation almost every day. And so they're creative managing working capital, right? If you, if you see what they're, and I, I actually think these experiences are fantastic, uh, but you have to survive them, right? You, you, ha you have to actually be reflective. And, and in our case, you know, we had immense strengths that helped us get through that, but, uh, but that's, you know, that's tail risk. Yeah. Yeah. So lesson number one is you're writing down those today. Have $100 billion in your balance sheet. So that's <laughs> Enterprise risk management starts, <laughs> starts with cash. That's okay, right. that's, the, uh, yeah, that's, that's right. lesson number one. Yeah, uh, actually, I mean, you did an MBA at Harvard. I did the, I did the cheats version. Yeah. I did the AMP at Harvard. And uh, uh, the, the, the guy who ran our, our program, we had this fantastic week at the end of it, uh, all about leadership and a whole bunch of things. And he said, listen, as you walk out the door here, I, th I want you to re remember only one thing from Harvard. He said, the only thing that matters is cash. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I dwelt yeah. on that a bit in 2008, yeah, exactly. 2009. Yeah. So um, let's move into GE a bit. Mm -hmm. And you're doing a, a bit on the, always doing a bit, but you're doing a fair bit on the portfolio at the moment. And how are you seeing the construct of the portfolio and the things that are going to make a difference to GE in the, in the years ahead in, in terms of delivering... The, the promise to shareholders. So in, in many ways, you know, GE has been a, a multi-business kind of conglomerate almost since the genesis of the company. Uh, it was the vision that, uh, you know, Thomas Edison had from the beginning was that, uh, you know, he looked across the applications of electricity. He also early on recognized the power of financing. And so it's almost been the, the essence of the company uh, for 140 years. And so there's always been a certain amount of portfolio management that is part of, you know, what we've done and how we looked at things. And I think, you know, every, you, you, you really need to manage this aggressively, particularly today. Uh, and, I, you know, I think as we looked at what we thought the world was going to be like, you know, living in a, you know, we were coming out of a time period for probably 10 or 15 years where the U.S. grew 4.5% GDP every year with no inflation, right? So the U.S. was really the dominant economy in the world for the 1980s and 1990s. We knew that was not going to be the same. So we're in a world with no tailwind where, you know, we thought uh, greater focus and, and more investment in things like R&D, uh, uh, globalization and things like that were going to be critically important. So, you know, the leadership teams really embraced that over the past uh, decade or more. And, you know, I, I always tell just one statistic. Uh, you know, Richard, I, I joined you in 1982. The company was 80% in the United States. I became CEO in 2001. We were 70% inside the United States. Uh, when we complete uh, uh, the, the Alstom acquisition, let's say next year, we'll be 70% outside the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, that's one generation of a complete change in terms of, and that, you know, think about the culture change and the things yeah. like that to go with it. So, uh, you know, our strategy right now is to be uh, 75, 25 industrial uh, uh, financial, to be a pure, on, on the industrial side, pure in infrastructure uh, company. So we acquired Alstom, which was a big acquisition for us. We spun out our, uh, our consumer finance business in the U.S. that does private label credit cards and retail finance. Big IPO, one of the biggest of the year in the United States. And we sold our appliance business, which has been a 100-year uh, GE uh, business. So we did all that this year, and that's all aligned with strategies we've talked to our investors about in terms of how to make the company more focused on infrastructure. So we're the biggest infrastructure technology company in the world, and that those businesses have a lot of interplay, technology, globalization, uh, customer interface, things like that. And then financial services just should be a smaller part of the overall portfolio. I was, it was about 50 percent uh, you know, when I became uh, a CEO, and it's just, that's just too much for where we were. And these are hard. You know, these are, selling businesses are joyless decisions, even when you know uh, they're the right thing to do. I had worked in the appliance business. The G brand means everything to me. And, and I was with, uh, over a week, and we were going to announce it on a Monday morning. And I was with my wife over the weekend. I said, I just feel like crap, you know. <laughs> we're going to announce this Monday morning. We worked there. We had a good time there. My daughter was young there, blah, blah, blah. And she said, I could give you more things to feel bad about than just that if you, want, <laughs> if you wanted to. So she, made, she put it in perspective for me. But, yeah. uh, 
But we have changed a lot. And I think you have to continue to, uh, you know, look, I think everybody needs to be paranoid about relevancy and what you do great in the world today. And, and there is no shelf life for, you know, reputation or anything else. And so I think we've always had a healthy paranoia about what we're good at and, and, and where we can invest. And the good part about GE is we've talked about uh, oil and gas here today. You know, we were a billion, less than a billion dollar oil and gas company to, in 2001. We're a $20 billion oil and gas technology company. So you can create things, you know, when, when you're in a company like ours. And you're crazy if you don't try to drive that kind of, uh, creation at the same time. It's good for employees, it's good for investors, it's good for customers. And and I've heard you say before, you try and position in, in sectors where there's better growth yeah. outlooks. Yeah. yeah. No, totally. I mean, I think if you look at uh, aviation, you know, our, uh, the big bet we've made that I, I don't think we're wrong is just uh, a billion people in the middle class in emerging markets. We went long that thesis really 10 years ago. And that leads to more energy needs. It leads to more airplanes, more rail technology, things like that. So regions like Africa for us, you know, when I, when I became CEO, it was uh, $500 million of revenue, G revenue, in the continent of Africa. That'll be more than $6 billion uh, this year. So it's not like the U.S. Is, is unimportant, but, you know, the engine of growth in the U.S. when it was growing at its best was... U.S. consumer was the engine, both in combination of their own wealth, but also taking on leverage. And that phrase really drove economic growth from 1980 till 2007. It ended badly, but those were big engines of growth. And so the question is, what's the next engine of growth? The U.S. consumer is still going to be important. The U.S. is going to be important. But this, this billion consumers, it's real. You know, I was in Myanmar early in the week. You know, these are countries that weren't couldn't even find on a map. In fact, most people still call it Burma. So there's confusion just in that, right? But it's opening up. It's got a chance. They need five gigawatts of electricity, et cetera, et cetera. These are regions and countries that are going to be really important for the future of GE. We'll do, we do $2 billion of revenue a year in Algeria. Right? Never would have thought that five or even 10 years ago. So that's, that's the opportunity we're trying, we're trying to tap. Right. So everyone sitting here now is thinking, how the heck does he run that company? How, how, so how do, you, how do you run GE? What's so I think, Richard, you, know, you and I have talked about this in the past because at West Farmers, you've done a lot the same thing. I think it's a combination of uh, very formal disciplines. So uh, you've got to have very formal disciplines that you can plug into. First thing, it's, uh, I've grown up here. So I've, I've uh, 32 years, uh, four different businesses. I probably know... I don't know, this is an estimate, so don't hold me to this. I probably know 10,000 people in the company, something like that, right? So I spent a, a lot of time on the road. I spent a lot of time with our employees. I spent a lot of time. So uh, hands-on knowledge, very formal disciplines, and a culture where bad news moves as fast as good news, right? So you, you, have, to, you have to have a combination of all three things, and then you have to be, I think, wildly paranoid about... Uh, how big is too big? You know, because there is a limit to size, and there is a limit to a good governance around size. And I think it's always up to us to prove that our model is a good model. You know, as you as you think about uh, as you think about the future, nobody's going to give us the benefit of the doubt on that. We've got to demonstrate that size is important for uh, employees, customers, investors, uh, communities, and and that's that's in question now. It's probably in more. In question today than any time in my career. Right. So it's all those, yeah. it's all those things. But like you, you know, um, I've known you for a long time. There's not one thing I could ask you about West Farmers that you don't have a pretty good answer. For, you know, that Maybe. you don't have a pretty good <laughs> sense of, because you, so. you 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 have the good combination of being able to go from thirty thousand feet to ground level mm. really quickly, and the CEOs I admire are ones that can go, you know, play at every altitude, almost in the same day. And, and, and know how, I haven't done every job at GE, but I know how every job gets done, you know, and, and I respect the people that do the work, and, and I have an affinity for that. I, not only have I spent my career with GE, but my father worked for GE for 40 years. So I, when, I, when I meet with first-line managers in the company, I always say, look, I know you because I grew up around you, and when I was 
at the kitchen table at home. I never knew who the CEO of GE was, but I knew who all you were. And when you were good, it was a good dinner conversation. And when you stunk, it was a bad dinner <laughs> conversation. So we have, I have real great respect for the people in the company that actually make things happen, get the work done. And, and, and I very much believe this, and I am totally sincere. You know, and I know you feel the same way. It's our job is to really to liberate them to let them do their best work. Yeah, great. Yeah. So um, that's a good segue into a bit more about you. Um, so, so your father, in fact, Andrea, yep. your wife worked in GE as well. Yep. Uh, um, and, and then you took over just a few days before 9-11 from a man widely regarded as one of the, the best CEOs in the world. Mm -hmm. How did you, f have you found the journey? So the... Uh, um, and, and by the way, so on, on the way you've dealt with Katrina, Fukushima, well, global financial crisis, you said four or five yeah, massive yeah, yeah. events on no, the way. The, um, so it was a very public uh, transition. You know, it was very... Uh, uh, extremely public, you know, so that was in the year 2000. And then at the end of 2000, uh, my predecessor, who I have immense respect for, was voted the um, finest manager for the last 100 years by Fortune magazine. <laughs> so you sit there and say, you know, this is a task <laughs> in and of itself. Uh, but I think what happened, and I, I don't know that this was, uh, this was a bad thing in general, but, you know, you had a, you had 9-11, um, Enron, and the tech bubble burst. Th those things all happened more or less at the same time. And I think in some ways it made it, uh, it made it more comfortable for me to run the company in a different way. In fact, almost necessary. So really inside the company, I've never had to worry about G team saying this is the way we used to do it. I think everybody looked forward. And that's a good part about culture. It was a good part about our team is that you know, I always had to fight for I always had to fight for myself in the public, but I never had to do that inside the company. And uh, I think one of the things that a CEO, I said this the first day I got the job, and I mean it today, is uh, you're going to question my decisions, but you'll never question my intentions. And I'd say both of those have been true, mm -hmm. having done this now for you know for 12 years. You have to make so many decisions; they're not all going to be right the day you do them, or they're not all going to be perfect. So people can disagree with that, but I think people know that I put the company first, and, and as do you, and I think that's, uh, that's important. And then I, I think for all of us as leaders, it's just being true to yourself. Uh, you know, leadership is a one-act play. You, people get in trouble, you know, when they try to be somebody else, you know, and I sometimes in front of an investor, I'll be doing a town hall, and somebody will say, well, you know, Warren Buffett would do it this way, and I said, well, you know, first of all, he's awesome. I have immense respect for him. But you know, you know how many people have gotten fired thinking they were Warren Buffett? <laughs> you know, <laughs> in other words, you're you're best off trying to stick to yeah. what you believe in and things and things like that. And I think I think over the last uh, we we we've uh, we've made a lot of the right uh, uh, calls. But it's I think these jobs are a joy. You know, it's uh, if you like your company, you, you know your your team. If you're curious about the way the world's going to work, uh, if, if you really believe in the power of business to do good things, you know, being CEO of GE is just about the best job. Yeah. You know, it's just about the best job in the world. And so I've always treated it that way. I, you know, I go see my colleagues and they feel like, oh, I'm getting beat up or the burden's too great. And I say, okay, then stop doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, don't ask. Nobody's going to give you a crying towel or feel sorry for any of us. Uh, but... I, the people I like the most are people that just love what they do and have immense uh, joy in the people they work with. Yeah. Yeah. And, and wh what are your aspirations for GE? So again, I, I think we've got, we've got a, the task in this generation was, I think, to reposition the company from a standpoint of portfolio, which we're well on the way, and then from a standpoint of uh, globalization, uh, technology and how our customers view us. So I think this has been, in, in a very volatile world, our task is really one of, of just repositioning for the next period of time. So we have a uh, fantastic portfolio of leadership businesses. So we've, we're, again, 75% best infrastructure company in the world, more balanced financial service. We've gone from 70% inside the US to 70% outside the United States. 
we have gone from investing 2% of our revenue in R&D to 5 to 6% of our revenue in R&D. And we're driving hard in what it means to drive really great customer outcomes. And in this generation, you know, David showed it earlier, you know, it's always been about physical science for us, as I said earlier, but if you really want to drive great customer outcomes, you have to be basic in analytics if you're an industrial company today. You have to be. Yeah. And so we are committed, Richard, as a company to making that technical transition as well. And, and, and have you thought about that, you know, 140-year-old company and, and a digital world? And so it's hard for a business, well, it depends on culture, I guess, mm -hmm. it's, but it can be hard for a business to adapt to, and, it, and it's, you know, one talks about the, the interlopers coming in and, you know, doing old businesses over. So how, mm -hmm. how do you make GE a new business and a fresh So again, I, th I think it's a combination of technology, you know, technology is always key. So it's not just knowing how to make great jet engines or great gas turbines. We have to add technology around uh, sensors, software, analytics, and that's capital and people. So it's investing the capital, but it's also recruiting people from outside the company that can come in and help us change. Uh, so that's on the technical side. And then I, I think companies get in trouble when they're not adventurous uh, from a business model standpoint. And so, look, I, I go around the world, I see more of our big customers that want to make a transition from uh, really a CapEx model to an OpEx model, mm. right? They, they, want to, they want to go from, hey, I have to invest uh, $40 billion every year to I want to invest, invest $20 billion, but I want to lease or I want to rent or I want to drive more variability. Now, look, if, if, you, if you sit in a room of uh, 50 GE finance managers, <laughs> they hate that, <laughs> right? They sit there and say, no, I don't want to do that. No. Good idea, let's not do it, right? But, but you have to have this kind of strength of will to say, these are changes we have to make, yeah. and we're going to make it, and we're going to drive it wherever it goes. And that's a combination, as you know, because you've done it. Uh, it's force of will at the top. It's, it's uh, having the right culture inside the company. But it's also bringing people in from the outside. Yeah. And, and in many ways, you know, I grew up in a journalist company, so I, I basically did the first 10 years of my career uh, 18 months at a time, you know, bounced around different businesses, things like that. We live in a domain, we live in a domain world. You, you have to know a function, a country, a business, things like that. It's not that movements still help, but I think sometimes when you grow up in a journalist company, people don't have enough respect for domain. And I think it's this combination of domain and breadth. Whoever masters that as a company is ultimately going to be uh, uh, very uh, successful. And so we, we try to build career, you know, I built my career broad first, deep second. We build careers today deep first, broad second. And that doesn't sound like a big change, but in many ways, that's a, that's yeah. a pretty big change. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Jeff, how do you feel about GE's broader role? You know, you and I talked a bit yeah. earlier about the role of business probably getting bigger because governments can do less mm -hmm. these days. How, how do you feel about GE's broader role? So, uh, it's, you know, Richard, I think it's something we all have to, think about, and I'm going to answer it in, in, uh, in really two different ways. One is the ability of industry to solve technical problems. So in 2004, we basically looked at uh, climate science inside the company. We had a bunch of our folks in R&D study the research. We, we looked at it very hard. We kind of we drew the conclusion that uh, you know, climate science was real, it was created by man. It was hard to really depict exactly what was going to happen. Those studies, I think, are harder. But we said on that foundation, we decided to invest massively inside the company in clean technology. And so we are massively big. We may be one of the biggest companies in the world in clean technology. Now, you know, if, if your role in the environment is just, if you think you're going to be able to tell people what not to do, and you think that's the way the economies are going to progress and problems get solved, it doesn't work. What happened in the United States? 2008 happened. The second 2008 happened, everybody talking green got sent to the room without dinner. And the only thing that mattered was jobs and economic growth. Yeah. And if you force yourself to make these choices between what do you want, all this stuff, we are never going to have a cleaner business world. We're never going to have a cleaner environment. You're going to lose. But if you say innovation is a way that you can drive massive change, and I've seen it happen in my lifetime. That's a role companies have. Mm. That's a massive role. 
And the other way, thing I would say is that in addition to all the geopolitics, which I'm not qualified to talk about, the biggest problem that the world has today is it's underemployed. Growth is too slow. Growth is too slow in every corner of the world. Growth is way too slow to get people back to work. And that's true, you know, I, I would say in Australia, you're at close to full employment, but you don't have the jobs you want. But it's true in India, China, United States, certainly true in Europe. We're not growing fast enough. And, you know, we should be viewed as the partner for growth. Yeah. And I, I think, I don't think that's a universal feeling. You know, I think it's still viewed, and it's a vestige of the financial crisis, and we should understand it. You know, it, that wasn't capitalism at its finest, and we all should share in that. But the sense is that unless, really, I would say at 35 or 4% GDP growth in the U.S., we solve every problem. Yeah. Budget deficit, Medicare, we solve every problem. At 2.2% GDP growth, we solve no problems. It's just arithmetic. So that's, I think, you know, that's, that's what I hope you do at the G20. I was going to say, did someone record, did someone take those notes? Because uh, so, that's exactly what I want to say. <laughs> what, what are you doing in three weeks' time? <laughs> you're, you're, on, you're on your own, brother, on that one. <laughs> so, you, say, you must have been out of the room that day. One of the yeah, exactly. One of the problems with that is, you know, if, if you assume every one of the G20 members is an elected official, and they're not, or, yeah. but if you assume they are, about six of them are either about to have an election or just had an election. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're dealing with domestic politics and you're dealing in sensible stuff. So yeah, no, no, it's... it's uh, stick it's, to what you're doing. It's <laughs> really... That's what you and I were saying is the uh, business people don't make good, you know, don't get elected much, you know, because we actually like to see things happen that are our, our way, you know. Yeah. So it's... We have an easier task in many ways. Right I'm going to go to the audience for questions in a minute, but um, uh, let's just, again, go off piste yeah. a bit. Um, so you're a, 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 a mad NFL person, played at Dartmouth, and uh, but you, you tell me you support three teams. Yeah. Well, that's worse than me. Um, <laughs> I mean, I switched teams, but yeah. three. So the Pats. The uh, so I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. So, so I'm a Bengals, Bengals fan. Yeah. We lived in Milwaukee uh, for five years. So I'm a Packers fan. And then when we owned NBC, uh, I was a part of negotiating the NFL contract with Robert Kraft, who owns the Patriots. So I'm a Patriot, so I'm a... And between, you know, when you root for three teams, your odds of actually having yeah, a good one right. are much higher. So I've learned that. <laughs> I've learned that. But like most of you people, I, I move nine or ten times, so I, I feel like I, I've earned the right to be a, a, a broad-based fan. Particularly when Brady's your quarterback exactly, at, yeah, uh, at, yeah. uh, at the Patriots. And uh, Dartmouth still have a, uh, yeah. a competitive side? Yeah, yeah. five and one. There yeah. you go. And, and Not that I care about it, but, you know, <laughs> it's... Uh, and do you ever go? Oh, sure. Sure, right. sure. Yeah. Not much, because I just, I don't have time, really. Yeah. But I, I, I'm, I'm a passionate, uh, you know, I know it's, this is politically incorrect in the world we live in today, but I think sports matter, right? You, you know, in other words, I hate to say this, but I, I do think, I do think uh, what you learn in terms of uh, competitiveness and teamwork and resiliency and failure in sports actually do help create people that are good in business, good in society, good parents, good teachers, and therefore I think sports matter. Uh, we had a, a, a discussion today that you would have appreciated. You, you should see it on brain science, because I, uh, I think that's what challenges a lot of the contact sports in the world today. Uh, personally, I think science is going to be our friend in that, but, but it's, it's something we all have to be, uh, be thinking about. Yeah. But, but I think I think sports matter. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah, one of the differences between Jeff and I is he never got concussed playing football, and I got concussed several times, so that's probably uh, yeah. explains a lot. <laughs> anyway, 